in Coimbra at Professor Gayatri Spearback's bedroom. She has kindly uh, accepted uh, to for an, uh, to an interview with us, Catarina, my colleague Catarina Martins and Adriana Bibiano. We are both from the Feminist uh, Studies program at Coimbra University. Professor Spivak uh, was uh, the, our guest speaker at the, yesterday's lecture, the inaugural lecture for the graduate, the, the postgraduate programs, the PhD programs for the Center of uh, Social Studies. And we thank you a lot for this extra time. It wasn't in the program, and you were kind enough to accept um, to, uh, for the, to this interview. Katarina, shall we start? Yes. Good afternoon, Good Mr. Afternoon Spivak. To you. Thank you <laughs> for having us here. Um, our first question is, of course, about the subaltern, because is this your best known concept? It is also the most misread and misquoted concept that I think we have amongst our students and in, in our academic uh, environment <coughs> in general. Uh, first of all, we have a translation question because in Portugal we have to know whether it is the subalterna as a feminine or a masculine word that, that means where is the gender position in the definition of the subaltern. I, I'll make <laughs> a kind of complex of questions around this theme and then you elaborate as you wish please. Uh, who or what is the subaltern and po possibly the story behind uh, your first uh, uh, mention of the subaltern in the article, Can the Subaltern Speak? Uh, yes, it should be a uh, subalterna. Because as you well know, a woman can be, uh, can indicate all of humanity. It doesn't always have to be men. And since my example is female, number one. Number two, who or what? Uh, the subaltern is not generalizable. If they were generalizable, then they would not be subaltern. It is, as a, a concept, a position without identity. Then, but it has to be filled with various uh, Gramsci's. It's not my concept, of course. It's Gramsci's concept. But Gramsci's concept is that they are small social groups on the fringes of history. And they have no citizenship. Citizenship would generalize them, and that is our effort. But all of the examples of subalternity which fill the position without identity are not generalizable. So it's not a being who. Uh, what can be perhaps uh, entertained, uh, but, but it's there are, uh, the concept changes as conjunctures change. Gramsci wrote in a very particular time and place at a very specific state with Sardinia and, and Africa and Islam and all of that stuff. I am in the border of West Bengal and Jharkhand in India. So there's no, I have to work with Gramsci's ungeneralizable uh, intellectual position to fill it with something that's changeful rather than something that I can say this is the subaltern. So, thank you. Mm. And I, this, uh, the, what we find, uh, at least in Portuguese academia, of course, that uh, we must be aware that we're always speaking from within Portuguese academia or Portuguese speaking academia. What we feel is that the term your uh, uh, concept of the subaltern has kind of been appropriated by uh, post-colonial studies, while the, it ha the, its gender dimension has been erased by the translation. You know, it has to, be to be, it has to do with the problems of the translation. This is interesting because, as I said, subalternity is not generalizable. Yeah. Full stop. Not generalizable. But within this subalternity, which does not have access to citizenship, these days, of course, subalterns vote. In Gramsci's day, no. They were bought their body count, just bodies, not minds. Now, in, within the subaltern situation, we have 
we have interns from Nigeria, which because we work with those um, unsystematized mother, many mother tongues of Africa. So right now we have an intern whose name is Oluwaseon Akinfenwa, smart guy. But of course, you know, from a very small rural university. I take him everywhere. And I took him to Princeton when he, he's not in New York now. But uh, I took him to Princeton when I was speaking to a post-colonial group. And I said to him, look, you sit there, but you have to ask a question. Don't just be a kind of dumb African. So he did ask an incredibly important question, he says. Now, within subaltern groups, is there subalternity? And I said to him, absolutely. Gender and something like caste. Because class is not so important because class is a generalizer. Class is abstract. But uh, something like caste and gender. So he had that sense to ask that question. The reason why I chose him was, you know, he's at a very rural university, Kwara State. And when I was interviewing him the second time, he described himself as elite, which was very correct, because after all, from that rural area, he's gone to university. So, but most people, you know, US folks, etc., they would describe themselves as subaltern, because they're a black, they're, because he's black. That, that subaltern is, it can be white. Antigone was sub subalternized. You know what I mean? Yeah. But you, 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 you just raised the question that we were discussing while we were having uh, lunch downstairs, which is class. Now, at least from where I'm sitting, and it's only my perception, uh, in the last decades, the, there's been kind of a um, hegemonic discourse on identities. Uh, it, that is, both in is, is feminist studies and post-colonial studies, identities, recognition, has taken the first place. And issues like redistribution, things to do with poverty and uh, the ways capitalists work and class have taken um, a second place. Not a second place, no place. No place. Well, I wasn't bold enough to say no place, but <laughs> yes. yeah, I, was, I had written down accents, but then I said, okay, this is a bit too much. No, it isn't. And if class is not and we need to talk about that yeah and you are always very aware of that mm -hmm. in your in your work but if class is not um, a concept that works anymore that's useful anymore to the present organization of capitalism what other concepts do we have class always works as i was saying with subalternity you have to move it you have to change it so therefore, the, after all, capitalism is not dead. <coughs> Finance capital <coughs> creates class, even though it's completely, supposedly completely para-human, right? Mm -hmm. You have to learn to look for class in ways that are not classical Marxist. Yeah. See what I mean? Yeah. So therefore, the, uh, and another thing is that the hiding of class is the, a very basic project of the global. This is why we are, have been bamboozled into thinking class doesn't work anymore. You know, I mean, this thing that I'm going to in Barcelona, open city biennial, biennial. See, they have no idea that all of their attitudinizing is a complete ignoring of the development of class. The class doesn't look like what it used to look like. It's not like the proletariat. Yes. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, but we have to learn to how to redefine Re class. You know what I mean? That's what, that brings me to my question. The, the notion of the subaltern is used mostly from within a, a post-colonial framework of thought. And from a feminist uh, framework of thought, it used to be more present. Now it has given a place to these identity projects. 
Could we blame this, these frames of thoughts in academia? Does it make sense to uh, uh, use the post-colonial uh, framework still? No, I think we should just move on. We should move on rather than blame. I mean, you know, how much time are we going to spend uh, correcting people? Move on. I mean, you haven't heard me write a great deal about post-colonial recently, have you? Because post-colonial, I mean, I read that stuff from Fano and Weber yesterday. Post-colonial uh, is now a kind of uh, excuse. The, and post-colonial is so different in located spaces outside. And the claim generally by fairly self-conscious identitarian migrants abroad in Europe that it's really not, it's not a category that one can work with. It's a category that one can analyze. Why is, you know, I always call it kind of the Mugabe uh, syndrome. This is colonial, so therefore, let me do whatever the hell I want to do. And, you know, so this is a very dangerous thing. As I said, you know, I have a piece in that lexicon, political lexicon that Stoller edits on development. And I said that one cannot begin the idea of development from capital and colony one must push it before. And so, therefore, I think that's what's on the agenda rather than carrying on about post-colonial. I think it has been taken up by the worst kind of, kinds of politics. And correcting it, sure, you can correct it, but at the end of the day, is that our project? Correcting bad uses? No, move on. So, therefore, I would say that uh, post-colonial, I don't care whether they're using subaltern, they're using it wrongly, obviously. They never, they do not know that there is no subaltern. You see, the, this position without identity and its form of appearance, Erscheinungsform, you, yes, in different uh, areas, it's phenomenological. The, the concept, I mean, these guys, Gramsci, Marx, they were smart students. And they felt that, I mean, Marx wrote a phenomenology of capital right there at the end of Capital One. Karl Marx, and I quote, says, there is no capital. There is no labor in that uh, Zogenante uh, primitive accumulation. Why does he say that? Because that's, Hegel haunted him. And the thing that really he felt was that in order to be useful, rather than this is what class is, the form of appearance of class has changed because the conjuncture has changed. So not the onto-phenomenological questions, what is it, who is it, but rather <coughs> how does it appear now, here, there, and so on. So that's what it is. And that's what I try to teach my students rather than all this bogus identity, you know? And where should we move on to? I mean, we uh, give up post-colonialism. So what's your suggestion? I read somewhere that you propose transnational cultural studies. Uh, that was a lot of, uh, no, transnational literacy. No, I don't okay. know where you should move. Mm -hmm. How can I know? You know, I've only met you like two or three times. And you have a wonderful, uh, a wonderful center. I'm very impressed by it. So I can't tell you where you should move. You, uh, I mean, you can redo whatever the position is. But I myself think that historical description, post-colonial, and taking it as a description of the person who is doing the, the research, leads to bad research. So you will move where your situation, your students, will make you move. I don't have any move there kind of suggestion. Also, I also you know, I don't even know where I would move. Yeah. It comes from the situation. Sorry, you were saying. Yeah, yeah. You were yeah, saying. Exactly. 
Also, we have uh, all kinds of students, and we are self-contending all the time. But I was run, uh, wondering, um, how important is still race? I was thinking of um, um, Dutch anthropologist Gloria Becker, who uh, argues in uh, uh, her book White Innocence. She argues that we are, at least in Europe, again, I'm talking within Europe, and taking, in, uh, taking into account even its uh, diversity, bearing in mind that we live in the different uh, countries with, and different cultures. But Gloria Becker says that, in fact, in Europe, uh, the issue of race is being kind of uh, avoided in a way, and it can only be addressed if whiteness is racialized. Mm. So that, that would, that's the way she proposes to for us to move forward thinking about race and how race works in Europe, Europe as a well, whole. It's a it's very right. old position. That was Stuart yeah. Hall's position. That white is, is it? Yes, absolutely. White is an ethnicity. Look into this stuff. You'll see. What I would like to say is that race and identity these are used ideologically to describe and hide the workings of greed and capital. You see, so these are ideological instruments, whereas gender is bigger than all of these things. Because whatever your race, you are within a certain kind of gender politics, which ain't good. <coughs> <coughs> so that's what my feeling is. Sure, one should, con I mean, I should know. I'm an old lady of color. I'm constantly, with low-grade racism, ageism, sexism, makes the world go around where I live. So, yes, it's important. But these are ideologies that are used, old prejudices that are used. These are, like I was saying, these are not things. Because it also does uh, tokenizing. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And so it's not something uh, with which will make us go forward. No. Look at how it's used. Positive, negative, showing, like gender is used, right? Yes. During the critical thing, the, the crisis, the women who were uh, at, uh, at the top in Goldman Sachs mm -hmm. were trotted out to show how good Goldman yes. Sachs was with gender, and they said how good Goldman Sachs was. Mm -hmm. This corporate stuff, I mean, I'm constantly invited, God knows why, I'm not a corporate person, but uh, I'm constantly invited to join them. Yeah. So these things are things that are used in order ideologically to make the workings of capital acceptable. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it is. Old prejudice. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, picking up on, the, on what you, you just said, um, you, you've stated that the only things to which have been uh, globalized are capital and data. What about the universities? I was thinking the way the universities work as corporations at the No, moment. within the universities also, what globalizes is capital and data. Okay. And the <coughs> next sentence is the more important one. Everything else is damage control. Mm -hmm. The university cannot pretend to be only capital and data because it has to pretend to be an educational institution. On the other hand, it is a corporation. So therefore, everything else is damage control. You have to say that, you know, the university is doing this, that, and the third thing. So that's what I'm talking about. You know, you have to present corporatization as a jolly thing. That's what I'm talking about. It's that second yeah. uh, sentence. But, but, uh, I was thinking the other way around. Uh, what they, what they, well, again, um, it's a very European per uh, perception. What the universities present is research and knowledge and pretend that they are not corporations, but in fact work as corporations. Yes, but them. you see what I'm trying to say is even within that, I didn't say only uh, uh, capital and data are globalized. Only capital and data globalize because they're abstract. Yeah. Capital is the abstract as such. 
data is the abstract average, as Marx would say, quantification, as we would say, of things which fall off in their rotundity. They globalize. Mm -hmm. Everything else is damage control. Teachers, damage control, the, mm -hmm. in my neck of the woods, the most bizarre and awful thing is digital humanities. You know, is damage control. Why, why do you find it bizarre? Well, it's not bizarre in the sense that it's to be expected. Because it's exactly what the humanities are not. Mm -hmm. And so they've just completely transformed the humanities into a kind of statistical bizarro. You know what I mean? That's not what they are. And so, you know, like I said, the ones, I mean, like my, many of my colleagues, the ones who are into it, they've lost the skill of actually doing humanities. Mm -hmm. That's why I say it's not bizarre, it's to be expected. Mm -hmm. It's saving intellectual labor. Yeah. Picking up on this idea and your proposal yesterday, uh, the study no model against the, mm -hmm. the hear learn model, and also no 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 no. Uh, learn is by itself. Don't you see if you are going to quote me on that one, it's a very difficult one. Yes. I don't <laughs> want you to say to your students, study learn. Here, study, no, here, learn. Nope. Yes. That's just, <laughs> That's what you know, it's a, it's, it would be completely wrong. I mean, it's completely wrong because mm -hmm. it's in that learn space. You know, Hegel in the master slave dialectic, just before he actually gets on to Bewusstsein, he talks about the complete annulment of, well, it can't be called consciousness, it's something, height, kite, not sein. Complete annulling, complete emptying, and then Bewusstsein emerges and a bad story begins. So that's where Hegel is writing about learn being covered over with the pride of self-consciousness and then the whole of it to the very end is a story which he repeats a million times because he expects everybody to make these kinds of mistakes it gets boring because again he will say the same thing because what he's saying is whatever self-consciousness thinks is completely wrong uh, it's it's that and then the phenomenological proceeds behind its back through the Algemein. Rede is Algemein. Now this kind of stuff is behind that learn thing, okay? So we must not, we, I, I would really ask you not to use this. And I was going to ask you, what is, as teachers, what uh, is our role? Our role is to study uh, and know. And ro uh, ro our responsibility. Our role and also and responsibility our methodology is to study in this and framework. Know. Study and know. Okay. Study and know. That's what it is. That's what we should do. But study and know. Well, as well as possible, as responsibly as possible. We are not going to, uh, going to think that that's the end of it. You see, I was looking at your course descriptions. Each one claims success. That's where, I mean, of course, you're selling these to students, but each one claims success. That's where you should halt. That yes, this is what we should do as teachers, but we now know that this is not enough. What about the unlearning process? No, unlearning what is a bullshit thing. No, unlearning for me is mm. European elite. I'm constantly asked, you know, schools of unlearning. But somewhere I heard you talk about Fahlian and which is Yes, it's because I had been invited. You see, yes. I'm very yes. careful when mm -hmm. people buy my first class tickets. <laughs> I had to say... lunch and dinner. I had lunch and dinner, <laughs> forget it, but because they kind of brainwash me. But I'm very careful, you know, I'm not going to accept the damn first class ticket for the huge, wonderful festival, which mm -hmm. they did to say we are not Nazis. And uh, say that, hey, everything you're doing is bullshit? No. But that's why I tried to be as careful as possible without lying. I think this whole 
whole craze about unlearning is extremely elite when hundreds and thousands and millions of people cannot enter the mainstream. And it, what we have to do is transform the mainstream, which, is, which has been my work. It's extremely difficult to do. I teach the state curriculum. I don't teach any unlearning. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I think that is a very irresponsible project, especially towards, an, towards migrants. Mm -hmm. The real focus should be redistribution. Mm -hmm. You know, because otherwise, the people who are underclass, they say, oh, those migrants are really, really a pain in the neck because they compete. Mm -hmm. huh? And we, nice, nice semi-feudal bourgeois leftists, they really help the economy. Yeah. Nope. The real issue, if we are on the left with migrants, is redistribution, not, not uh, identity and be nice to these cultures, etc. No. Mm -hmm. So I mean, if they have, after all, come away. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, they're Europeans. So therefore, no, I'm not into our learning. I did say Fellainen because. I mean, you know, you, context, it's everything yeah. is is situational. Nothing is correct. <coughs> Nothing is correct. So you speak situationally. Yeah, but I'm still worried about the teaching. I'm kind of obsessed with the teaching because I, I also see my, myself primarily as a teacher, or almost as a teacher. So um, what what are you worried about? Uh, how to do the right thing? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, without coercion. No, but that, that, that was hardly the question. As you were, that I was going to ask, and I am going to ask, as you were uh, talking, I was suddenly <coughs> reminded Sorry. of an old song by the Pink Floyd. This is the early 80s, I believe, which, which is another break in the wall, uh, which is a kind of statement against the school. And this is done, a song by a choir of working class uh, kids, London kids, and it's obscene. It's obscene that you make a group of working class kids whose only possibility of uh, access to another class is school, making them think another break in, a, a, I, I don't mean, but no education, another break in the world. So I, I was thinking about that, about the, the how, uh, for instance, questioning the, the school as, uh, as a disciplinary instrument, which it is, or tool, which it is, uh, has this um, irresponsible side to it. Uh, yes, but to make it responsible. Yeah. You know, that's what I'm saying. It's rather than go off to something else, remain within it. And, you know, I taught in 99, I think, a course on GLA. Now, there are, I mean, I am not a good teacher, but I'm an extremely, I really am not. I'm extremely sincere so that there are some students who can learn from me. Mm -hmm. the, and so there have been four or five students, you know, I can name them, Max Kramer, Diana Ruiz, Juan, Juan Barrio. They have said that their lives were changed by that course. Alicia Rosenthal. What was that course? It was like take two pages and follow through on all the documentation. The, it is absolutely a model of study and no. Mm -hmm. Follow through on all the documentation in the original language. And if you don't know it, catch someone, tell us. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I, I think rather than throw away, because so often <coughs> today, you know, like this business about white being a thing, so often today, there is a kind of carelessness towards history yeah. in the yes, teaching. Yes. I mean, when I was talking about the gendering in Politeia, mm -hmm. who the hell notices it? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So you have to be, you have to be very good towards studying and knowing so that the other thing maybe will surprise you. You see, that's maybe that's where you will end up. It's not something that you take on as this is the thing to do. Yeah. No, no. Because then I will hear people saying, we are really hearing. And I'll say, oh, Kaitili, 
Why did you say it? <laughs> this was in a self-help self group. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Why did you say it? Because this has happened before. They are doing, about that. Do you they are doing all kinds of things that? that I haven't been able to do in 40 years. <laughs> But they're doing it. I, I'd like to just insert a question and I think you can run with what well, I want. Right. I mean, I w I'm trying to imagine myself in the context of our center and in the context <coughs> of the work we have been developing in, in what direction it has been developed and why our students stick to your concept of the subaltern. I mean, because it serves them in this simple notion of the colonial and they find probably your work hard to read because it brings us back to uh, reading uh, uh, Europe, 18th century, 19th century, uh, Europe and philosophy and all that things that you think have been forgotten, their gender dimension, their class dimension, their power dimension yes. as a whole. So uh, we, uh, they m more easily go into what you also a question yesterday, and I re would really like you to develop on that alternative knowledges and epistemologies. Made, epistemologies I we think call it they th are completely bogus. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you, people who have come for validation to universities that are on the model of medieval Europe, then within that framework, the, and you know, medieval Europe had a lot to do with Islam and so on. I'm not saying. Medieval Europe model is all just white folks like your uh, Swedish or whatever, what you call it. You see, it's Dutch. A, and very black. Okay, Dutch. Okay. And very black. No, no, not. <laughs> no, was, yeah. But the thing is, it's that's the problem. Yeah. You see, coming from a very black position, that's the problem. So the it's 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 so I'm not I'm asking you not to imagine yourself. Okay, that's already a fact. Mm -hmm. So what is there to imagine? The imagining is the, on the other side, mm -hmm. but you're doing that with your students. So, the alternative epistemologies discourage them, because you know if there has been within Africa the guy that Dutch guy whose name begins with P, which is not his real name, and uh, he certainly wrote uh, very carefully about Bantu epistemology, but he actually did work very hard at it. He wasn't offering it as a very nice thing. He was studying it. You know what I mean? So that even folks like Suleiman Rashid Diang, these uh, Polang Tonji, the ones who work on African philosophy, they like what he did. He's a Dutch guy, as it happens. But and not very black. But the thing <laughs> is but the thing is that so there are, and I was talking about Bimal Krishna Motilal, those who do something like other ways of knowing, which is what, see, first of all, they don't think of them as alternative, okay? To think alternative is to be Eurocentric. Mm -hmm. Alternative to what, pray tell? So, in fact, this is something that I, we, because people always say, you know, in my culture, we think differently. The moment you can say my culture, you're not within it. Because if you are within it, then you think it's human nature. You don't think it's a culture. It's really true. Yeah. You know, so the, the, this whole business in the United States of selling your image and so on. People think that's human nature, not the culture of greed and capitalism. That's what a culture is. So therefore, discourage them, I would say. See here, I'm very clear. Mm -hmm. This nicely, nicely turn them into another direction. Let me uh, tell you this. Two, I'll give you two examples. One of them, a man, Austrian Pakistani, okay? Father Pakistani, mother Austrian, Shakli Bhati. The other, a woman, Ritu Birla. Birla is a name as big as Rockefeller or or, uh, you know, like it's, it's a huge name, uh, Ford, you know, it's a name like that. So Ritu is now associate professor <coughs> at um, Toronto of History, my students. And Shakil is associate director of Trips and Trims. Trips and Trims, trade-related uh, intellectual property and trade-related investment measures. 
having to do with uh, GATT and WTO and all that stuff in Geneva, in the UN headquarters. As you know, the directors are figureheads. They're changed quite a lot. It's the associate directors who do the work. And he's been associate director for God knows how long. OK, Shaki wanted to do an identity thing. You know, I, I had, like you're saying, your concept of the subaltern. Subaltern is not a concept. It's a description. You know, it's a description on, uh, you know, small uh, groups on the fringes of history. That ain't a concept. But the thing is that I had some kind of a bizarro concept at that time called affective value, mm -hmm. value form. Okay, see, he really liked it. And where has it gone? God knows. But he wanted to do this with Urdu. And I said, Shaquille, you don't know any Urdu, man. Don't do affective value. This ain't a good thing. No, I must do it. So I sent him to Pakistan. I have friends in Pakistan. He came back, and I told the friends that, look, this guy wants to do affective value. He doesn't know a damn thing about Urdu. So put some sense in his head. <laughs> so Shaki comes back. He's a smart, wonderful guy. <laughs> he comes back, and then he takes my uh, Marx class, which was on the Uruguay round of GATT, mm -hmm. and he reads a book called Recolonization by, what was his name? Maybe Chakravarti Raghavan. He said, Professor Pivak, I want to work with Chakravarti Raghavan. And I said, look, Chakravarti Raghavan doesn't know who the hell I am, and he could give a damn. You know, you can't go, I'll do something. I'll introduce you to Amartya Sen. If Amartya Sen, you know the Nobel yeah. Prize, Amartya Sen thinks you are uh, convincing, then he can speak to Chakravarti Raghavan. Well, Amartya did, and uh, Shakil went to Geneva, and look where he is. And he, wa he wanted to do identity, right? Yeah. But he's doing something much more important. And then he really is looking at subalternity. Mm -hmm. Because that development stuff, you know, indigenous knowledge, etc., mm -hmm. that's subalternization. Mm -hmm. And then this, you know, uh, DNA patenting, all that stuff, mm -hmm. that's his work. Yeah. And on the other side, Ritu wanted to do, you know, culture, my culture type thing. So I said, Ritu, you come from this extraordinary uh, 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 world of financiers. Write about that. Mm -hmm. Become a historian of uh, f family based non uh, Western capital. Capital. Ritu's grand great grandfather, great grandfather? No. Yes. Was before independence, Ganshan Das Birla, the sixth richest man in the world. Mm -hmm. Before independence, an Indian. So you can imagine they're a completely different model, you know, like um, uh, almost potlatch-like use of surplus, all those dharamshalas, etc. Family capitalism. And so she wrote a book, How the British Fought This, you know, and she, it's called Stages of Capital. It is such a fantastic book that she won not just a South Asia history prize, but a British history prize. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? So that's the way... I ad advise my good students when they are naturally moving with this <laughs> Because look, I had the usual identity crisis that the middle class, well-placed metropolitan migrant has. And as a result, I wrote two finger pointing articles, three women's texts, mm -hmm. and can the subaltern speak? You understand? But then, you know, when in 86 I entered the work of real hands-on activism, mm -hmm. I realized complicity. Mm -hmm. Everything, they have folded together. And so therefore, what was my title? Outside, mm -hmm. in the teaching machine. That became the model. Mm -hmm. Can the subaltern speak is before that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So that was the beginning. What happened? I began to work for the subaltern. So it's very different from in order to create a situation where perhaps there will be infrastructure which will listen, which, mm -hmm. which is what it means to speak, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So that's my story about identity. And it is natural. Even Edward Said told me, I suddenly felt that I was orientalized. Mm -hmm. You know, but that's not a place to begin. I acknowledge that I felt it. But that was a United States feeling. You know what I mean? 
Mm -hmm. so. but, but can you help? I was uh, yesterday in the, the introduction, uh, introducing, uh, introducing you uh, to uh, the lecture, I mentioned the problem, which not, I really don't know if it is a problem of misquoting you, misreading you, and misquoting you. The thing is that you cannot av avoid that. You cannot avoid the apt use of your own words. And perhaps, you know, perhaps they changing, crossing frontiers and changing uh, places, they might still be useful. I don't mind, you know, I mean, yeah. unlike... You cannot control it. I not, unlike <laughs> Ernest de la Clau, who is a very dear friend of mine, <laughs> or Edward himself, I don't go on and on correcting people. Yeah. If they are reading that in my work, then I must have written in such a way yeah. that people from that conjuncture will read it like that. Yes. Learn something, write differently next time. Yeah. You know what I mean? So the fact that it can work tells me nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, because given the situation within which it works, it's, uh, I mean, I'm ashamed. You know, that because it generally is the university student seeking validation from yes. a so-called minority who then feels and that's really um, supporting um, a very bad group. I mean, they're nice as human beings, yeah. but they're bourgeois ideologues and, you know, they will, and what the world offers for them to do good is very feudal, top-down philanthropy. And yeah. so I'm helping them by writing in such a way that they can read it. Uh, I was thinking about the connection <coughs> of this connection between theory uh, and practices and the, your last answer reminded me of a phenomenon which I have witnessed um, in, uh, in academia uh, recently which is the um, deep, deepening of, uh, of a tendency for self-referential theory. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, a frenzy of quotations and... From oneself? Uh, no, from, from others. Oh, uh, Self-referential theory. So people go on, you know, uh, on buzzwords, uh, like six, six buzzwords per line, and a frenzy of quotation. And it has to do with that seeking validation. So, the, the, mm. so it has even, you know, uh, research such as research in feminist studies or research. Yeah, they find these words through kind of digital searching. You know, that's how they find them. But what I would say is you can't solve the entire conjuncture. Yeah. So therefore, my task is to teach as carefully as I can. I, it, and as I say, I don't succeed with them. They generally can talk the talk but can't walk the walk or won't yeah. walk the walk. But if you succeed with one, it's a hundred. Yeah. 